Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. This week we're going to be fulfilling a request I get an awful lot and that is can you build a space station in deep space? But we're going to fulfill another question I get a lot as well and that is can you build a space station that gets really really close to the sun? So guys I present to you the Helios Space Station, a space station designed to research the effect of getting very close to the center of our solar system. We're going to be packing it full of science. It's going to have some rotating gravity rings as well to uh, prevent things like, you know, bone atrophy and stuff like that. Uh, and we're also going to adorn it with radiators as well because I am, I, I, I am led to believe that it's quite warm near the sun but i don't know we've, we've never we've never really been all that close to the sun in Laon aerospace 2 the second one so uh, we should probably take every precaution we can just in case it does turn out to be quite warm so as you can see we are constructing the main core of the space station right now on screen i have put two uh four of those gigantic extending radiator panels and then on every single habitation module i'm putting some of those uh peripherally mounted ones as well just the, you know, just, the just the static ones and uh, you can see I've put those rotor pieces in place as well what we'll do is we'll construct the uh, rotating rings you know first and then we'll offset the rotors to be away from the space station so that we can assemble the fairing piece around it and then we'll offset them back in I mean you guys are going to see it when it gets built but I am aware that these time lapses do play back quite quickly so just going to summarize it now whilst uh, I remember to talk about it and then the very uh, the anterior aspect of the space station's body we're going to add the actual science sort of area so we've got that payload fairing piece it's not a payload fairing is it it's a uh uh, I don't even know what it's called. Just the cargo shroud thingy that was that came with making history, I believe. That piece. Uh, we just hit some batteries and some um, SAS wheels inside it. We'll also put an RTG inside it as well. I'm not sure if I put one in just yet, but I think I, I know for a fact I did put one in after the fact if it's not already in there. And then uh, we can <coughs> cap off those science arms that contain all of the science units uh, with some solar panel. Uh, solar panel arms, I guess, <laughs> and we're going to have them extend out using the breaking ground robotic hinges. It's going to be epic, guys. Here we are constructing the actual habitation ring. They're pretty small diameter. I'm not going to lie to you. It's fairly unrealistic if this were going to be built at you know, with humans in mind. If this was going to be built for humans, the ring would need to be much, much bigger, and uh, it's going to be spinning a lot faster than it should be. If it were going to be this size and it was going to be built for humans, okay, the radius of the ring is too small, but also it's going to spin way too fast. Unfortunately, the slowest RPM you can set these rings to in Kerbal Space Program is uh, five revolutions per minute. That's just what those rotors can be toggled down to, which unfortunately is too fast to uh, generate realistic gravity. But hey, we're not working at human scale. We're working at Kerbal scale and Kerbals are smaller than humans. Uh, they'll, they'll be fine, you know, it, it's mainly there for them to just sort of, they can sleep in those rings and then they can perform their day-to-day -day activities in zero gravity. I think just having a space, <laughs> was that a pun? Having a space in this space station that uh, features real gravity in the form of that ring uh, would be useful to help maintain sort of general body functions. One of the issues that humans are going to face when we do eventually go interplanetary is stuff like the eyes. For those that don't know, that's my like real life specialty area. Uh, you would go blind on an interplanetary travel, on an, inter on an interstellar quest, <laughs> if you will. Because uh, your eyes, you know, the drainage systems that keep the eye pressure normalized, they rely on the force of gravity. If gravity is absent, the eyes can't regulate their pressure well enough and you'll, you'll probably succumb to glaucoma, if not another horrible way, way of losing your sight. So these are all issues that scientists are going to have to overcome when it comes to sending humans on long space missions. Uh, so just having gravity just for things like that, I don't know how Kerbal eyes work, I'm not going to lie to you guys, I'm not that good, but <laughs> we can, one could assume that they are, they function similarly to human eyes, although uh, they, they don't seem to be blind after I've sent them on 150 year long flights and without any gravity rings, so who knows, who can really say? They don't seem to need to eat or sleep or anything, so much is yet to be learned about the Kerbals. Anyway, some of you may be wondering what that little module at the front of the space station is, the one with the little fuel tank and the side-mounted engines. That, my friends, is the escape pod. 
It's got just over 2,000 units of Delta V, which is more than enough fuel for it to get back to Kerbin. And, uh, well, that's what that piece is there. Now we need to construct the uh, interplanetary tug, which needs to be absolutely massive. It takes a surprising amount of Delta V to get to the sun. Well, actually, this might make sense for Kerbal Space Program players, but for those who don't play Kerbal Space Program or haven't played it very much, or, you know, people who don't know anything about orbital mechanics, you might, it's quite easy to assume that it would be easy to get to the sun from Earth, because, well, it's just there, it's the sun. Just leave Earth and you'll fall into it. But the thing is, Earth is not just hovering above the sun, we're orbiting the sun. Very, very quickly, in fact. You have to overcome all of that velocity that Earth is moving at in order to drop down to the sun, which takes a colossal amount of fuel. Which is why we've got a lot of fuel in the interplanetary tug stage, because it's going to take a lot of fuel to get us close to the sun. We won't be doing uh, the direct approach going straight from Kerbin, but I won't spoil the surprise. You guys have got lots of twists and turns to look forward to throughout this video, but that's why, you know, there it is. There's so much fuel in this thing. So it's so big and heavy that I decided that the most sensible way of uh, getting this mission going is to launch both parts of the craft separately and then dock them in low Kerbin orbit. And by two parts of the craft, I mean this, the interplanetary tug section, and then of course the actual space station itself. So um, that's what we're going to do. The bills are now finished. Let's get on to the launch of phase one, which is, of course, the space station. Now, some of you may be wondering the, uh, about the, the weird Kerbal names <laughs> that are in the corner of the screen. The reason I've got um, some Kerbal tourists who have strange names is because a while ago, I think it was the Soviet Skylon mission video, but don't hold me to that. I'm not quite sure. But in a video a while ago, I did an SSTO to Minmus. And I wanted to bring some passengers with me, but I thought rather than bring, you know, generic Kerbals, I'll hit up my Discord server, link to join, that is in the description as always, by the way. <laughs> uh, but no, I thought I'd hit up the Discord server and say, yo, first three people to reply, or four people to reply, or whatever it was, um, I'll, I'll take your username and make it into a Kerbal, and you can be a tourist on my mission. And it, went, it was really good, I really liked having that interaction, but then, I don't know, is it possible to, like, fire? Kerbals <laughs> in Kerbals Field, just get rid of them because for now I just forever have those tourists in my like Kerbal roster and they're always right at the top of the list of Kerbals before I do a mission and it's like oh I, I keep on accidentally putting the tourists back in my craft so you know what I was like enough is enough I'm gonna just put them on this mission and just send them off into deep space and never see them ever again so that's why I've got those Kerbals there so you guys who you have had a Kerbal named after you You've once again featured in a Matt Lown epic Kerbal Space Program adventure video, so take whatever you want to take away from that. But there we have it, the fairings are deployed, the space station is now in orbit, well it's not quite in orbit, but it's, it's getting there, it's nearly in orbit. Uh, so what I'm going to do is we're going to circularize this thing in a nice stable orbit and then we're going to detach that lower stage, which the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed, I fitted a probe core and SAS wheel to so that it can safely deorbit itself and not leave low Kerbin orbit cluttered up with loads of space debris. We do obviously still need it for our Kerbin circularization, but because we took a fairly flat ascent profile, it means we've only got about 35 meters per second of delta V required in order to circularize our orbit. And we are now done. Oh, bit of a wobbly rocket just there. I mean, the rocket wobbled a bit just then because the Rhino engine, which is powering that lower stage, is quite powerful. Um, our actual interplanetary transfer tug uses four nuclear engines, which have very, very low thrust to weight ratio. And hopefully the low TWR will uh, stop the ship from wobbling excessively like it did just then. And everything should be nice and safe. Uh, here we are deorbiting the lower stage. Uh, I guess it's not that interesting to watch, is it? So we can just cross fade across to the next phase of the mission, which is, of course, launching the interplanetary tug. So we're going to first of all set the space station that's sitting in orbit as our target. I usually wait for it to just go out, sort of get to that sea that sits to the west of the uh, Kerbal Space Center, and then we can launch. So I've got this sort of chunky SLS looking rocket here. Didn't need to be too big because those SRBs on the side provide a monstrous amount of thrust, so the rest of the rocket didn't need to be too powerful. Uh, we're just going to blast our way up and uh, and circularize. I'm trying to think of interesting things to talk about with this rocket, but I've already talked, I've done a lot of Kerbal Space Program videos. In case you guys haven't seen, if you guys are new to my channel, then hello, but I, I guess that I feel like most people You've, most of you guys have heard of me at this point. That sounds super arrogant. Now I say it out loud, doesn't it? It's like, don't you know who I am? But no, I, I have done a lot of 
rocket launches in my life and I've talked a lot about I've talked about them a lot as well on this channel so I feel like I'm running out of things to say me meaningful things to say as each video goes by but we're gonna we're all gonna struggle through it together guys um, not quite sure what started this thought process I feel it might have been those SRBs but they are now long gone now and our thrust weight ratio is no longer quite so good it's it's not bad with the mammoth stage just here but once this burns out and we're using the uh, the lower thrust rhino stage it's going to be a fairly slow process getting into orbit luckily i i am going to speed the footage up for you guys it's not going to be too long for you but for me it was it was a bit of more this launch is a little bit more painful than the uh, the first rocket we launched in this little mini series video uh, but as you can see we are now well into that rhino burn just there and we are making good progress only about sort of 500 ish meters per second of speed left to gain that's a great sentence isn't it 500 meters per second of speed left to gain it's a friday night guys you know it's been a busy week you just gotta look sometimes you just gotta bear with these commentaries as we as we soldier our way through them so rapidly running out of speed although it wasn't my plan to circularize in the rhino stage because this particular lower stage does not have any means of deorbiting itself uh, deorbiting itself so uh, we're going to do the final bit of our circularization and indeed the docking with the space station using those nuclear engines themselves so i'm quickly plotting a little maneuver node here just to try and get ourselves a nice close approach with our target as you can see our target is slightly ahead of us so we need to enter a lower orbit initially so that we travel a little bit faster to enable us to catch up to our target so as you see i'm aiming i'm aiming those purple second uh, encounter nodes the first encounter occurs a little bit too soon so i went to i aimed for the second encounter as our encounter that we'd be getting close to the target to and uh, we've got a pretty good uh, maneuver but maneuver node set up just here i don't worry about getting things too close and precise on our initial burn because maneuver nodes are not that accurate and they're not a hundred percent representative of the orbit you will eventually end up in so as long as you get it sort of moderately close it's fine and then now there's only minimal amounts of speed to gain and lose in order to get our desired encounter or separation i should say uh, that it won't be too difficult to make minor adjustments to get our separation nice and close. I usually aim for a separation of anything between, I don't know, 0 0.0 and 0 0.3 kilometers. You know, Kerbal Space Program's like map screen is not particularly accurate. And once you're there, it's easier to make the adjustments you need to make. So I've got a 0 0.2 kilometer separation, I think. Oh, 0 0.3. There you go. So, you know, we're going to just warp around to that encounter and then we're going to start burning retrograde relative to our target. And uh, where is it? I'm trying to find it. Although I've, it looks like I've given up. I thought I was looking for it. But I guess I'm not now. So it's going to kill our target velocity down to zero. Then we're just going to point ourselves towards the target and burn again. And uh, that will just point us straight. There it is. We're going to just point us straight towards it. And we can do a little puff with the engines. And then as we get closer, once we get our closest approach again, we just kill off all of our speed. Rinse and repeat. Burn towards the target. Kill off all our speed. Burn towards the target. This is just the easy way of getting... Of getting to uh getting to a target you want to get to i suppose and then of course we're going to be implementing the uh the famous loun lazy method of docking to dot these two two things together i'm not quite sure how I, that sort of become a thing that i've some like in air quotes discovered because i just i only found out that it was even a thing that i did that no one else did because people started mentioning in the comments like oh that's a really cool method of docking you have just there i just assumed that's how everyone did it i guess because i i guess that just goes to show that i am exceptionally lazy that i can pioneer new methods of uh you know effortlessness <laughs> i don't know it's cute i had a direct message the other day actually from a guy who wants to start making kerbal space program youtube videos but he was said can i uh, does he have can i like can i give him permission to use my so-called loud and lazy method of docking in videos or will i give him a copyright strike if i use it and i'm like dude i'm just using the docking system that's in the game i think i'd have to be a pretty crappy person to copyright claim people like oh that that'd be like i don't know would be like I, I i don't really watch many gamers on youtube but maybe like i don't be like it it would be like a csgo player copyright claiming another csgo player because he used the same gun and camo as him and used generally the same techniques like you can't you can't i'm not gonna copy i'm not gonna copyright i'm not gonna copyright just using an in-game mechanic don't worry guys you couldn't you can use the loud and lazy method of docking in your YouTube videos if you want. And you don't even need to actually call it the loud and lazy method of docking because it's not. That's what it is. It's just it's just using the docking 
system in a lazy way. I mean, I now need to probably describe it in a bit more detail for those that have no idea what I'm talking about. The loud and lazy method is when you select the docking port you want to dock to as your target, which I've now done. And then once you've got it aligned up, you then switch to the other ship and do the exact same thing. And then both ships will just maintain alignment using the auto SAS feature. So we can just point towards the interplanetary tug. And as you can see, the interplanetary tug is aligning to us. They keep, they stay aligned and it's great. Uh, it doesn't work with all probes. If you've got comnet settings or if you haven't got the tech unlocked just yet, it doesn't always work with probes. But if you've got a pilot Kerbal on board both, then it should always work perfectly. And as you can see, we don't need any RCS, anything like that. The two ships mate perfectly. And there we are. We have our singular interplanetary craft that will get us to our, to our final orbit, I suppose. And so without further ado, let's get making maneuver nodes. Now I'm going to perform three escape burns in order to leave Kerbin's sphere of influence as our ship has very low thrust to weight ratio due to its very, very high mass. And those four nuclear engines are fairly low thrust as it is. In order to achieve maximum efficiency, we want to spend as much time performing our escape burns at Kerbin periapsis as possible, as the Oberth effect states that firing a rocket engine at high speeds causes a greater change in kinetic energy than when fired at a low speed, and the periapsis of any orbit marks the point of highest speed and lowest gravitational potential. So, by splitting my burn into three parts like this, we're maximizing the amount of time spent at Kerbin periapsis and thus expending less fuel overall. Now, some of you may be wondering, though, <laughs> why I'm aiming to get our spacecraft away from the sun, like I'm raising our orbit above the sun, rather than, you know, going the more intuitive way of going away from Kerbin and heading towards the sun. Same sort of way you'd go to get to Eve or Moho. The reason for this is that it's actually more efficient to reach the sun this way than simply lowering our orbit from Kerbin directly. I did mention this very briefly earlier, but allow me to explain in a little bit more detail now that I've got nothing really else to talk about whilst this mission goes on. Using the example of just trying to get something to hit the sun, Kerbin orbits the sun at approximately 9.3 kilometers per second. This means that in order to impact the sun, we would need to decelerate our spacecraft by 9.3 kilometers per second and cancel out all of our horizontal momentum. This would, of course, require a monumental amount of fuel and an impractically large spacecraft as a consequence of that. However, Joule, which is the orbital height that I'm aiming for, that orbits the sun much slower, between 3.9 and 4.3 kilometers per second, depending on whereabouts it is in its orbit. This means that if we were to try and perform a sun dive from Joule, we would only need to decelerate by around 4 kilometers per second, over half the value we would need to alter our speed uh, if we were just going to do it from Kerbin. So, sure, it does take a little bit of extra delta V to actually get to Joule, but even with this added cost taken into consideration, we still save a lot of fuel overall with this flight plan. So yes, this uh, flight plan I'm going with. Uh, I'm going to continue to raise our apoapsis to roughly the same height as Joule, and then once we reach our apoapsis, we'll decelerate until our sun's periapsis is below 1,000 megameters, or 1,000 million meters, if you want to be weird about it. I'm aiming for uh, 990 megameters, to be precise. Um, and this isn't arbitrary. A periapsis below 1,000 megameters is significant, as it's the point at which the science experiments report go, go from reporting being in space high above the sun to space close to the sun, giving us more science points and, crucially, providing data for our R&D lab that we have yet to uh, obtain. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I've ever, like in real life whilst I play this game, uh, if I've ever gathered science data from space close to the sun before. So this is a first time for me as well. Anyway, before I continue talking about the future, let's quickly address something I'm doing here. I had these little separatable fuel tanks in the middle of the spacecraft just there. Those were anchor points for the rings and solar panel arms to be strutted to during the descent from Kerbin. Those rings would freely spin if it weren't for those pieces there holding them on. But now that they're not needed because we're in zero gravity, uh, we can deploy them. I did, first of all, though, lower our periapsis around Kerbin to, you know, enter Kerbin's atmosphere. So those pieces will not just be left floating aimlessly. They will smash back into the planet. 
Obviously, I'd rather our spacecraft didn't meet a similar fate, so we can just do another. We could do a prograde burn now just to raise our periapsis to a safe height. I'm still going to go for a fairly high height, though, because our next burn is going to be the longest of the lot. We're going to be burning for a very long time, so I want enough space between our periapsis and, you know, the atmosphere, uh, such that when we do our burn, it's not going to lower our periapsis enough that we're going to enter the atmosphere and slow down again. So that's kind of why I went for a some moderately high periapsis because you know when we start our burn we're going to be pointing slightly radially in so it is going to force our periapsis down at first anyway we can just time warp down and uh, get started on the burn now these burns were exceedingly tedious i actually sped them up a lot i sped the footage up a lot faster than i normally do in these kerbal space program videos typically the fastest i speed the footage up is uh four times faster than normal just incredibly boring bits other bits is generally around two times faster than normal but for the for the big burns with these nuclear engines i sped it up to 12 times regular speed just to make it a bit more tolerable for you guys because it was they were very, very long burns. I've said it before now, but those nuclear engines, they really don't have very good thrust to weight ratio. So we're not going to be going anywhere fast with such a big payload. So it was a very long burn. Yeah, now you're watching it at 12 times speed just there. Now I've talked a bit about, you know, how I'm doing this burn up to dual height to save fuel. But some of you have probably noticed the glaring uh, know, elephant in the room, as it were, that why didn't I just do a gravity assisted dual? and uh, get a lot of our next stage in the mission done for free by using Jules' gravity well rather than doing a retrograde burn at great expense at our uh, sun apoapsis. And the reason for this is this is just easier and I kind of wanted to make this mission, I wanted to do this mission without gravity assists just to make it a little bit easier uh, for players who kind of want to do a mission like this but aren't too confident with gravity assists. It would make it a little bit easier for them to replicate so that's just why i decided not to do a dual gravity assist if i wanted to make the space station any bigger or more epic or you know just get into a lower orbit around the sun than the orbit we eventually did then i probably would have caved and done a gravity assist around jewel but i didn't in this instance now uh this is kind of similar to uh the nasa parker solar probe which is currently en route to our real life sun i believe it's destined to get there around 2025 now the initial plan for that spacecraft was doing something similar to this going all the way up to jupiter and then slingshotting around jupiter and sending it sending it hurtling towards the sun that's how it was going to reach the sun however there would have been an issue there with the solar panels that would have been powering the spacecraft all the way out of jupiter they wouldn't have really provided adequate power for the spacecraft. At least that was a big concern of the probe's designers. So, and uh, they couldn't put a nuclear power plant in there at the time because that just wasn't allowed when they were in the design phase of the mission. Things have changed now, but they were so far along at this point that they'd committed to solar panels. So what the Parker Solar Probe is currently doing is lots and lots of slingshots around Venus. That was the other way we could have done this mission is do a slingshot off EVE. But it takes a lot more gravity assists because... Again, as I said earlier, it's leaving from Earth and it's going to Venus. It's traveling a lot, lot faster than it would be if it was traveling up at Jupiter. So it's got a lot more orbital velocity to shed than it would if it was you know, way up high above the sun. In fact, it's need it needs to do seven gravity assists around Venus in order to sufficiently lower its orbit. And uh, interestingly, it was just last month that it completed its third pass of Venus. So it's getting there. Uh, the Parker Solar Probe is definitely one to look for. It's going to get uh, close to the sun than we ever have before and uh, it's going to it's gonna find some cool data. I didn't really know how to end that sentence now I, and I started saying it. Now as you can see I failed to address the fact that we have done our retrograde burn. Now we can start descending down to the sun and as we get a little bit closer I decided you know what things are about to get a bit toasty on board so we may as well deploy those big radiator pieces which of course first of all means deploying the solar panels as well and now they're all done we can start the rest of our descent down to the sun with obviously a big key point being that moment we pass the 1000 megameter point uh, of our orbit and we enter space near the sun which should be happening imminently now some of you out there may be wondering, why didn't I go for a lower periapsis? My initial plan, in fact, was uh, to go for 500 megameters rather than 
990 megameters, but the heat was just too intense for our poor space station. It was a bit weirdly inconsistent though. When I was testing this craft, it seemed able to be to you know, quite happily sit in an orbit of 500 megameters without anything exploding, but then on other occasions it would succumb to the heat destruction as high as 700 megameters, which is a shame. I decided to play it safe then with our orbit of 990 megameters and you know, it's highly elliptical, so the actual time duration the spacecraft will sit in the intense heat of space near the sun will be relatively short, so we shouldn't have too many problems relating to horrific explosions and rapid unplanned disassembly. And as you can see, we've pretty much exhausted all of the fuel in that lower stage. I saved the last little breath of liquid fuel there just to uh, get the engine stage clear, and uh, we're going to destroy it by crashing it into the MUN. Yes, that's that was the easiest celestial body to reach from this location. Well, if technically Kerbin was, I thought, you know what, it might be more fun to just crash it into the MUN because, uh, I don't know, I don't know if it's good to be sending nuclear payloads hurtling into Kerbin's atmosphere at colossal speed, so I thought it better, better be, it might be safer to just crash this into the MUN when we're not putting any lives at risk, provided we miss our MUN colony, of course, but it would be exceptionally unlucky, I think, to hit the MUN colony uh, with that level of precision. Right, well, lack of precision, I should say. We're just basically hurling this thing into the mun at whichever spot it happens to land at, so be it. Now, we've only got a delta V budget of 109 meters per second, which is not very much. So uh, we're going to split our burn into two burns. So we're going to do our retrograde burn first, just now. And then we're going to do our inclination change when we're at sun uh, apoapsis. Inclination changes, uh, they're quite expensive generally, but they are cheaper if you're going as slow as possible. So inclination changes, uh, they're always cheaper to do at apoapsis of any given orbit. So we're going to do our retrograde burn now, and then we'll warp around to apoapsis and do our inclination change. So we'll get us our final Kerbin encounter, which we can then fine tune to get our MUN collision course set up. So here's our first burn chugging along nicely now. And uh, now that that's done, we can create a maneuver node at apoapsis and get that inclination change onto a collision course with the MUN. There we go, so we can set it as our target. We're just going to drag on the other vectors of the maneuver node maker until we got our desired collision course. And uh, that looks pretty good. It's a bit it's a bit finicky to get the maneuver node maker to uh, make maneuver nodes with this level of precision. I know people are probably going to comment now that there is a precise node function built into Kerbal Space Program now, but I'm old school. And uh, I'm just lazy, and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to do it now. I've already started doing it with the Maneuver Node Maker, so please forgive my inefficient gameplay. <laughs> uh, it's it's fine. It all worked in the end, guys. If it's stupid and it works, it isn't stupid. It's just inefficient. Uh, so only, only just under 20 meters per second of burning to do, uh, and that's now done. And then once we're getting close to the end of the burn, we can switch over to the map screen and... Uh, do it by eye because the nav ball or the uh, maneuver node maker doesn't always get it dead on as you can see i i managed to make a colossal saving of 0.1 meters per second so uh, you know 10 centimeters per, se <laughs> per second that's a lot of delta v guys it's always worth making these savings so do make sure you switch to the map screen during the final phase of your burn uh, so you can just eyeball it and make sure you're getting things dead on and now we're entering co <laughs> oh my goodness at the edge of uh, Kerbin's sphere of influence. We're already going 10 kilometers per second, which is uh, very, very fast. So uh, we're not going to be spending much time uh, looking at the MUN before we crash into it. I'm now going to drop the footage down to real-time speed. Uh, we're now in real-time speed. This is how fast we're moving. I've not accelerated this footage at all. Oh my gosh, guys, it's going to be epic. Hmm. Well... A, li a little bit anticlimactic, we just disintegrated into absolutely nothing upon MUN impact. But then again, that was the objective of me crashing this thing into the MUN. And now we can get to uh, the space station itself. It's pretty much done. The only thing left to do, aside from doing our science experiments, of course, is to orient the escape pod into its final location. Obviously, it's currently occluding that uh, Capola module. And obviously, I'd quite like Kerbal to be able to be look out of that unimpeded because it is this station's observatory so we're going to move the escape pod and stick it 
on the side of the craft. The reason I launched this in this configuration is because the escape craft is quite heavy because it's got that big fuel tank, which of course has very high mass. So if we'd stuck it in its like final orientation when we launched it, it would have offset the center of mass, made this thing a lot more difficult to fly, especially when we had our interplanetary tug attached and we were doing all of our interplanetary burns. It would have been very, very difficult to keep ourselves on a straight vector with that kind of center of mass offset. So that's why uh, for the majority of this flight up until this point, this thing has been sat uh, at the nose of the craft, which is, of course, along the thrust vector, as in like you know the thrust direction of the engines. Uh, if that makes sense, I hope that made sense. It felt like I was stumbling uh, across my words towards the end, but I think we made it through regardless. And now we can start doing some science. Actually, I suppose we can't get too ahead of ourselves. We need to make sure those gravity rings work. I actually haven't tested them for the majority of this flight. And we probably should have tested that tested them before we launched in case there was a mechanical failure. But uh, whatever. We just, in, in, in the motors, we trust and we have faith. And uh, as you can see, we needn't have worried at all. They work beautifully. Now, the reason I've got two and the reason why I have them rotating in opposite directions to each other is so that their torque cancels out and they don't... Uh, in, induce a rotation in the central body of the spacecraft. Gravity rings, when you've only got one ring, it will make the spacecraft, as in like the central spacecraft that it's rotating around, rotate the opposite direction. And I'd like the central spacecraft to remain, you know, stable. So it's got SAS wheels on it, so that would help to overcome the, tor the torque created by the ring. Uh, and the ring itself is quite small, so we might not have had any issues by only having one gra gravity ring. But I thought, let's just make things 100% safe and 100% guaranteed that we're not going to uh, have ex excessive torque applied upon the space station's body by just having that second ring rotating in the opposite direction. So now we are approaching the 1000 megameter point, and we are now in space uh, near to the sun. And so we can get straight to performing our science experiments. We're going to have to be quick because uh, Traegar Kerman is uh, looking a bit warm just there with that temperature gauge. I can just quickly disable that by pressing F10. And we can run our science experiments and gather all of the useful data we will undoubtedly gather by running the experiments. Now, I'm going to address something that people might get bothered by in the comments. And that is why am I not calling the sun Kerbal, which is the name of the sun, right? No! This, this Look, it even says it in the science reports. It's called The Sun. Every time it's mentioned in the game, it's never called Kerbal. It's always called The Sun. It's only ever been called Kerbal on the, wiki, on the Kerbal Space Program wiki and in the forums. In the game, it is never once ever referred to as Kerbal, nor is the, you know, the, the overall solar system referred to as the Kerbal system. Kerbal is and always has been a fan name. I think it's become canon now in Kerbal Space Program 2. Although not much is known about Kerbal Space Program 2, uh, the, Nate Simpson, the director, has confirmed that the original Kerbal system will be returning. So presumably the sun will be renamed Kerbal or... Again, Kerbal Space Program 2 ultimately is a fan game. By extension, therefore, Nate Simpson is a fan of Kerbal Space Program. He might just still be referring to it in, from the perspective of a fan. And the canon name is very much still The Sun. Who knows, though? I guess we'll just have to wait for Kerbal Space Program 2 to come out for us to get answers. Luckily, uh, this celestial body's name is the only question that remains unanswered. We've run all of the science experiments that we're able to. Uh, we've done, we, I activated one of the telescopes as well, just for the, uh, just for the giggles, I suppose. And, uh, actually, I guess that's it. The video is done. We can take in some nice, uh, last shots of the space station before I go back to the tracking station and do other things and forget it even exists. Uh, there's a shot of, how, of the view inside the gravity ring. It's a shame it's, we're going backwards. Uh, at least, you know, the orientation of these chairs is backwards relative to the rotation of this particular ring. Whatever, it's not, not a big deal, I suppose. The key thing is that it's got gravity, so Kerbals can just chill there and sleep there and stuff like that, and hopefully they won't go blind. That is a big motto of Lan Aerospace. We choose, we would like to hope that our astronauts don't go blind on their long missions. And with those, with those uh, heroic, historic words, I leave you with an end screen. On the left-hand side is a link to uh, another video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm based on your viewing habits. The right-hand side is my most recent upload. There's also links to things like Twitter, Discord, Patreon, merchandise, all that good stuff in the description of this video. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.